But welcome everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. My name is Ash. I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective and I'm really excited to welcome back tonight editor Z Zane McNeil for a conversation with contributor, contributors to their latest collection, Y'all Means All, The Emerging Voices Queering Appalachia. Before we start, uh, if this is the first time you're, you're joining an event with us, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a 14-year-old worker-owned cooperative and radical bookstore in so-called Asheville, North Carolina, on the traditional lands of Cherokee people. We're an anarchist collective that is well known for our curated inventory of titles related to feminism, queerness, social movements, and radical politics. We ship books all across the country, and if you haven't checked us out yet, our full catalog is available on our website, which I will drop links to in the chat. Firestorm is also a community event space. Unfortunately, with the ongoing pandemic, we continue to be on hiatus from in-person gatherings and have transitioned our community and author events entirely to an online virtual space. With that said, we do have a list of exciting virtual, virtual events coming up. Notably, uh, on Tuesday, May 10th, we're hosting a panel discussion on the future of gay liberation to celebrate the recent translation of Guy Hawking Games, Gay Liberation After May 68. So if you're interested in signing up for that or any other events through Firestorm, you can follow us on social media and I'll drop a link to our community calendar in the chat. A note for those attending in the live audience, there will be time at the end of today's conversation for Q&A. Um, so if you're interested in asking a question at any point, I'll encourage you to submit them throughout the discussion by using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen if you're attending on Zoom or in the comments if you're following along on the Facebook live stream. Cool, moving on to tonight's event and speakers. Y'all Means All is a multidisciplinary and multi-genre collection that provides examples of how contemporary Appalachians are defining themselves on their own terms. While providing blunt commentary on the region's past and present, the book's soul is sustained by the resilience exhibited by its authors. Zane McNeil is a scholar, is a scholar activist with a BA in history and an MA in political science. He's an experienced organizer and has worked in the sphere of public policy, government relations, and animal law in the nonprofit sector. They are the co-editor of Queer and Trans Voices, Achieving Liberation Through Consistent Anti-Oppression, and the recent collection, Vegan Entanglements, Dismantling Racial and Carceral Capitalism. Hannah Conway, is a PhD candidate in the History of Science Department at Harvard University. They are an interdisciplinary scholar working at the intersections of history, science and technology studies, and visual art in Appalachia in the Deep South. They held MAs in history and the history of science from the College of Charleston and Harvard University, as well as a BS in technical photography from Appalachian State University and currently reside full-time in Memphis, Tennessee. Hannah is an enrolled citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Sarah Getz is a time-based artist who writes instructions that's, that shift problematic realities into speculative fictions. They received their MFA from The Ohio State University in 2017 and their BA in Visual and Media Studies Arts Arts of the Moving Image, and Documentary Studies from Duke University in 2011. Kendall Lawyer is a dancer, dance maker, scholar, educator, photographer, and creative writer. Her movement practice investigates memory, embodied processes of remembering, and themes of dispossession, haunting, and displacement. Her doctoral research aims to unravel the queer layers of time, geography, and embodiment in Appalachia 
through the lens of critical dance studies. Her work focuses on performance, storytelling, labor, protest, folk life ways, and the radical world making of white trash aesthetics under the necropolitical violence of racial capitalism. So y'all, thank you so much for taking the time to be here tonight. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Zane. Thank you so much, Ash, and thank you for everyone who's attending. Um, this book is very much a labor of love. It's my third time, I was talking about this earlier, that I've been able to speak with Firestorm about my collections, but this one I think is probably closest to my heart. I've been working on it for also the longest and it has the longest history, and I think it also probably will have the largest impact, and obviously the community we've made from it is really important. So a little bit of history about this collection is it came from a activist zine community that I tried to create in like 2018 after Electric Dirt. And so I met a lot of the wonderful contributors of this collection in that space, very much focused on like Appalachians do it in the dirt, queer Appalachia, you know, like kind of like a really fun queer in the dirt, anti-metronormative understanding of queerness and based around advocacy and community building and mutual aid. And so it came out of a really exciting uh, and a really empowering time, I think, for a lot of us. But it also has, you know, a hard history as a lot of edited collections do. And it went through so many different iterations and being dropped and then picked up again and has just this long history. And so I'm so thrilled to be here to talk about all the messiness that Y'all means all is, and to be holding space with all of you today. Uh, so Ash did a wonderful job just kind of introducing me and my work. I'm from Morgantown, West Virginia. I'm currently located in Orlando, Florida. I wrote this when I, I started thinking through this collection when I was actually in Budapest, Hungary, doing my master's. And it was really that idea of, of being completely removed from everything I understood as Appalachian until I recognized that that was an identity that made sense to me. And so as my accent came out more when I was in Eastern Europe, and I felt for the first time after the release of Queer Appalachia's Electric Dirt, that I was kind of equipped with the language to understand my own queerness in a way that I hadn't seen before living in spaces around DC and Baltimore. And so how did that community that Queer Appalachia created helped us all connect with each other and, and really create this book, which the, the product itself and the, uh, the object of this book is, is really awesome. And I'm really, really proud of it. But I think I'm almost more proud of the community we created being in conversation with all of you. So that's a little bit about me. I know that we all had great introductions, but if everyone wants to go around a little bit and just kind of like introduce themselves and talk about how they found this project, what interests them about it. Who's going to go first? All right, Kendall, I'm calling on you. Man, okay. <laughs> You're trying um, to hide in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Um, how did I find this project? Um, so Zane had posted on Instagram, I think it was like a call. Um, and I just like liked the page, I think. And you're like, hey, like, your queer dance stuff might be cool. Like you should submit a, like an abstract. And I was like, so my department has um, like a very strict, like no writing anything until your ABD, like very, you know, just very particular. They don't, they just don't you to make like an ass out of yourself. Uh, do you know what I mean? And like write something that you'd be embarrassed about later when you're like a little more knowledgeable on your topic maybe. Um, anyway, so I was like, mm, I don't know if I need another thing to do absolutely I'm gonna do this <laughs> so um I submitted an abstract and Zane was like yeah great awesome and th that's kind of how how I got here I guess um as far as my interest in like I think it took me a long time to understand my Appalachian-ness um, and I think uh, I, I've heard this echo throughout um, several conversations I've had, and I think Zane just mentioned it, like, I didn't, I don't think I realized it until, like, 
God, like I wasn't around the people I was used to being around. And I was like, wait, this is something really different. Um, I mean, it doesn't help that I was in Southern California, like <laughs> of all places, like it's just, it's just very different. And um, it, it just, it just felt very strange in, um, in, in finding uh, like the thing that made sense and being able to like point to it and be like, yes, this. Um, and I feel like, um, like my graduate research, um, I don't, I don't even like to call it research. Like it feels really icky to say research. Um, but investigation, it's an experiment in, in, in having a conversation with people and putting together ideas. And, um, I feel like like folk practice in particular gave me a way to talk about it that made sense. It didn't feel like extractive. Um, so that, that, that's kind of one of the things I'm exploring in, in, in my chapter, which I believe I'm supposed to talk about at this juncture. Is that correct, Sam? I'll, I'll ask you in a second. Okay, okay. I'll like a little, a little a dip to get everyone excited to learn more about you, Kendall. <gasps> A bit more. I'm a little bit of a spaz, but I'm also very under caffeinated because it's 7:15. But um, yeah, I, it's just I, I'm I'm super excited to be a part of this project because I feel like it feels a little familial at this point because we've been like chilling and bouncing ideas off of each other for so long that um, it feels it feels really awesome. So I'm super excited to be here tonight. Yeah, and this is our official book launch but we were able to be at asa a few of us um not not hannah and sarah but it was a good time and you both missed out uh but we were able to do that and have sort of like our first family gathering which was really fun uh sarah do you want to introduce yourself and sort of how you found this project and what your little research and your like your interests are and everything sure sure um so oh um I found this project, I, I appreciate what you said, Zane, about uh, how much this is about like queer Appalachian community because uh, I found this project because of a queer Appalachian photographer that I knew um, who was like, hey, um, this is me, this is you. We met outside of the South, but I think one of the things that's been really grounding for me as weirdly that a, a lot of the spaces that I've found to find vocabularies for my own queerness were outside of the South, but all of the, um, my deep, well, not all, but many of my, my, uh, like deep long lasting chosen family connections are with people who are in the South have, have either lived there for a large period of their life or from there. And, um, so this, this, I came to the, what I wrote here, which I know we'll talk about more in a minute because I was in Northern California actually. And that was the first place where a group of people said, like, said to me, you can use the pronouns you want, <laughs> like, that's fine. You can ask for that. And, um, and to make it to make a real space for me, which then in its weird paradox, it, it created a paradox where it's like uh, there's only there's a home in the South and a home outside of the South that that I am always trying to retwine somehow or like reweave. Um, but that's the this writing the piece that I wrote for this, but and and then um, you know seeing this, you know, beautiful list of collaborators um, that also wrote for this work um, was something that was really trying, like felt a little bit like an anchor for me um, being where I was at the time in Northern California, um, back to the place that felt more like home, especially through the pandemic, because the, this project started pre-pandemic and to see it continue to pick back up and, to see all of these people sort of cluster together now um, has been really exciting. Um, what I do beyond uh, what I wrote for this, well, the other thing was that it um, was, 
um, at the time I'd been doing largely like lecture performances because I was trying to think through a lot of things that had to do with language. And um, but my background is largely in, in filmmaking, but also embodied performance and printmaking. So I had actually just finished making a, a letterpress book um, about um, coming to a vocabulary of non-binariness, having never heard of trans people as a kid, you know, like that didn't exist for me. I didn't know what they were, like much less that I could be part of that community or that community would welcome me and um, be a family. Um, so I think that, and it, so now I'm in um, Boston. Um, I moved here a week ago. Um, this is my cat number one collaborator, Tacoma. Um, who's literally got my back right now and always does. Um, and yeah, I think that I'll come back around to more of those themes as we carry on, but really honored to be here. Thank you all. Well, there's already so much I wanna talk about, right? <laughs> Just being able to talk through some of the, of the themes I'm hearing from everyone talking. Uh, but Hannah, I'm excited to hear a little about you and how you found the project and, and your interests. Yeah, so I also found it via Instagram, I'm pretty sure. Um, I think you put out a call on the Marks in the Mountains page. Um, and I wasn't entirely sure if I had a piece that would fit. Um, like Ash said, I do uh, have an undergraduate degree in photography, but I've, I've been a pretty strict historian since my first master's degree. And so I... Um, I didn't really know <laughs> how much people wanted to hear about the history of science or the history of technology in this piece. But um, I, my work, I grew up in Roanoke. I did grow up in Appalachia. I mean, I guess it's not technically in the Appalachian Regional Commission, but there's a lot of politics about that. But I mean, I grew up solidly in Franklin County, which is, is deeply Appalachian in many kinds of ways. And um, I am a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, but my ancestors are native to what is now known as Northern Georgia and Eastern Tennessee. So, you know, deeply Appalachian, uh, you know, for many, many generations. So, um, or what is now known as Appalachia. Uh, and, but I had been doing, so I am in Memphis and my work deals with uh, the complicated legacy of the Tennessee Valley Authority infrastructure more broadly, but the TVA here in the South. Um, and I, you know, when I was in the archives, I was coming across a lot of things and came across this really fascinating um, archive collection of photographs that had been taken of one of the first, and I'll talk more about it in the chapter, but, um, you know, thinking through sort of, uh, you know, queer time and these kinds of theories I was working with and a um, actually Black, Brown and Queer group uh, at Harvard was really informative to how I was thinking about sort of the, the weird temporality that I was finding in the archive when I was working in it. Um, so I think I just, sent you a DM. I think I just slid in your DM. <laughs> so it's like, do you have any interest in some weird history of tech stuff um, that, you know, I like, you know, tech and culture isn't going to publish. <laughs> no, you know, this it's not going to find a home elsewhere. Um, so that's how I came uh, to the project. I also similarly uh, you know, grew up in the South, lived in the South until I, I also moved to Boston, although I, I quickly, as soon as I could, moved away. It, it, it was too cold and too expensive for me. Um, but I really hope you like it there <laughs> while you're there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just really sort of personally and politically committed to uh, the South as a region, Appalachia as a region. Um, I love living here. I'm on Chickasaw land now, but I'd love to get back, you know, eventually to um, traditional Shalagi land. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to be here and talk about this book. It was quite a process. It was very fun. Yeah, and Hannah knows the process pretty closely. They, they helped copy edit uh, the book. And so they're, they're very familiar, probably more than I am with all the chapters by now. But it is <laughs> funny, you know, because we're thinking about this moment of time and, and weird temporalities. And then when you add like COVID temporalities in it too, and then queer time into it, because this book has a history of four years and feels like it's been going on for 20 Right. And then it's very much, I think, from for most of us, a, a product of two, 2018. Right. And so like all the, for me, you know, and uh, I feel like so many, of us have, so many of us have grown in community and, and uh, strengthened our our interests and our like affirmations and connection to Appalachia and just in different parts of our lives 
But for me, this book was really stabilizing. You know, at ASA, I was talking about how no matter where I was living or what job I had or who I was dating, this book was always there, right? And even though I might have changed in the past four years, it's still, you know, it's a piece of all of us right there. And it grew so much out of it. And so I'd love to hear each of you talk a little about your chapters and, and just get us all excited to read it. Ken, I'm going to start with you again. I'm sorry, because you started the first time. It's the pattern. I'll be ready. I'm so ready. Um, so um, my chapter, um, goodness, um, every time I think about it, it just feels like a different I was just like a different scholar, I, I, a scholar. I don't even know what that means actually, but like, I was just a different human when I wrote it. And um, like, I was not yet ABD as I, as I discussed. Um, and it was like a, like a little nugget of a seminar paper that I was writing. And it, it was the first time that I actually wrote about what would become my dissertation. So it, it was like the very first piece. Um, and as I'm now working on my dissertation, it's like a thing that I'm gonna like rework the ideas of um, and, you know, obviously make it into something else, but the, but the concepts are, are what seems to be sticking around for me. Um, so what, there was a lot going on for me personally while I was writing it. Um, I was in the process of losing my father to a very rare kind of cancer. Um, and, and I wanted to like, it felt like I needed to write something about it, but like the thing that kept coming up for me was the things that we did together, which happened to be like gardening, right? Like we planted our garden together. We, we saved the seeds together. Like it, there was this process that we did together that, that like with our bodies, right? <laughs> like I talk about it as like a strange duet. Um, that could have been two solos, um, like us physically in the garden together. Um, so it, it's it's um, it's about loss, but it's also about how we remember with our bodies and through our bodily actions. Um, so the thing, like the big nugget for me that came out of this, that is, I can't like I can't escape from it, is this concept of plant time. Um, which is like so many people that, that I, that I've talked to about it or, or have read this, like my friends and stuff, um, have connected so strongly to that, to that concept. Um, so plant time, spoiler alert, <laughs> um, is like this concept of looking to plants and their articulations uh, of time. Um, so how, how do plants embody time? Um, and I think it's a really, like, it's a really radical concept that I think, um, oh God, what do we want? I'd like black and indigenous folks, people of color have been talking about this like forever, right? Like, this is not new. This is not a new thing. It's just like, I, I was just like, oh, plants, plant time, right? Like this is this is nothing new. It's just in the concept of the academy, in scholarship, in academic writing, it doesn't feel like I have read that it may exist. It probably exists, <laughs> but um, so if we look at plants um, and how they articulate time and how they embody time, um, wouldn't that be a very like radical space for us to inhabit and to live in? Um, that's pretty much like, to be blunt, like a oh, fuck you to capitalist, like heteronormative, like time. Um, so it feels like plants are pretty gay and pretty queer and we can look to plants to give us a little information um, of, about how to understand that. Um, so thinking through time queerly gives us a little bit of freedom to play. And, and to give ourselves the space that our bodies need. Um, plant time, okay. So then also, <laughs> as a side note, I was playing a little bit with form. Um, I, it, it's hard for me to read like strictly academic work. Like, it, it, like it's hard for me to like, be like this, 
person said this thing and like we take it like that it somehow is more important than what I know from planting this thing like so I was playing a little bit with what does my garden what does microcosm tell me um, which is my garden's name <laughs> what does microcosm tell me that might have something to say to you know Jose Munoz you know like what what are they saying together um, and what are they offering me that might be something different? So, um, so plants, that's what my chapter is. Plant time. Love. Um, I like have long conversations with people about how much I love my orchids because they, they are really patient plants. They, they, they're like, you need two weeks to not pay attention to me. It's cool. I'll be here when you come back. And I, yeah, I just really love them. But um, okay, yeah. So my chapter um, was, and I mean, to call it a chapter is really kind of a weird thing to me um, because it it literally was a, a script. At least initially, it was a script from a talk that I had given multiple times. And it's very much about orality, um, about um, thinking about what it is to be from a place and to, and, uh, um, and to develop language from that place. So, so really what it is, is that um, after I moved away from the South uh, when I was about 20, three, 24, maybe. Um, I moved to Ohio to do my master's. Oh, we have an audience. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, and they're back. <laughs> um, uh, I moved to Ohio and was like, this is just the weirdest. This is so, it was just so, it felt so strange. And every time I would be around, um, I had one friend in my grad program that was also from the South. And whenever we would get together, I could just hear my voice changing um, and hear my accent come out, which doesn't come out most of the time, um, like 90% of the time, 95% of the time. And usually it's just when I'm talking to my mom or my dad or my brother, um, and I can hear their accents are stronger than mine because they're around Southern people all the time. And um, uh, there was this moment when I was, uh, I don't know, a couple, handful of years later, maybe 25, 26, something like that. Um, maybe 27, 28, I don't know, when I first read the word non-binary and I used it, um, you know, I used it to text friends. I talked about it all the time. I was shocked like it was just it, like you could it's um there's a moment when you can first there's this quarry next to where I used to live in Durham um North Carolina um that I keep forgetting that many of these people are in North Carolina right now so I'm like I don't have to specify um anyway so there's this quarry in Durham the, the Eno River quarry and I would always like test myself at the beginning of the um, summer season, like, is it warm enough to jump in now? And I would always jump in when it was too cold. And there's this feeling of like all the air, like leaving your body um, that I really love. It felt like cleansing and, and purifying in some way. I don't know when, when you jump in and it's too cold. And that's kind of how I felt when, when this concept first entered my vocabulary through people through my students I was teaching in grad school at the time and my students of course this that like younger generation was less like oh duh <laughs> like you've never heard of this how can how is that possible um but um so I heard I at the moment you know I would hear these, these people with Ohio accents, Midwest accents saying non-binary and um, a little bit, but mostly what I would hear is people who are from like the Northeast um, or the, or California um, or like Oregon and anywhere on the Pacific. Um, 
use use these terms. I remember the moment, the very first moment I heard somebody say AFAB out loud. I was just like, oh, that's how you say that. You know, like, like uh, it was just kind of a weird moment. Something that uh, was completely a, a read and written thing instead of a spoken thing. And, and I've always really like thought about this, like some of it is this like hypothetical idea of like what would happen if, um, there is like a generational passing of this vocabulary that had come to me through say my, my ancestors, my parents, anybody. And it's, to be fair, it's, it's actually kind of gone the other way now. Um, uh, because now my mom is like, oh, you know, non-binary. I think, I think that might be me. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, mama, <laughs> that's great. That's so great. Um, you know, like five years later, <laughs> um, but um, anyway, so I had this question in my head of like, well, what would it sound like if, if I, you know, if somebody had said non-binary to me and to, to hear that in a language that felt like, um, like it has that home space. And whereas like whenever my Southern accent comes out, I, I often feel a little just kind of odd because it's, it doesn't, I'm not often in places where it does feel natural. And it's not often when I'm in places where it feels natural that I feel like I can talk about deep gender theory. <laughs> um, at the same time, like, like I said, like there's a closeness, there's a closeness to queer community in the South that cannot be replaced anywhere else. Um, every time I've lived in a big city in San Francisco, where I was for the last four or five years, there, there's, there's not a, um, I feel like in, in the South, my experience of queerness was like automatic family and um, that's not, that wasn't the case there. So it was like, a. for me, this project was trying to reconcile these, what felt like two halves of home, like the like blood home, blood relations, um, family of origin, home, um, and all the things like, you know, fireflies and being really sweaty <laughs> that felt like home to me um, with all the the things that felt like home like being really seen in in large groups of people <laughs> um, uh, that I first experienced in Northern California and I can almost hear my voice change as I talk about the two spaces but um, but yeah so my my piece really was about was uh, this piece of writing where I would like give these talks. I did it in New York. I did it in uh, like in Michigan once. I did it in San Francisco a couple of times where I would then, I would like make the audience repeat back to me this weird mix of my, my mom's accent, my brother's accent, like my grandma's accent and um, see if I could get people to, under, to say non-binary in a way that I had never heard ever. And I still don't hear because it's just, I don't know, maybe it's something that I need to, to do every time I say it, I don't know. But yeah, so it was um, very much a, a uh, what felt like fiction um, through the lens of many, many non-fictions and um, it, was really exciting to me to get to have this this short little piece um, inside of folks' deep theory and and artistic expression as well. So, who? All right, Hannah. Um. Yeah. Wow. I have lots of thoughts. First of all, I want a plants or gay sticker. Um, or like t-shirt, like, I feel like we need to, to market that. <laughs> Not for the purpose of capitalism, just for the purpose of spreading the message. Some merch for fun, some merch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have so many, 
I have so many thoughts on the the accent thing, obviously, and it's it's interesting in you know Southern or Appalachian spaces kind of talking about accents because before I was in between doing my undergrad and doing my first master's and part of why I did my first while I did my first master's, um, you know, I worked a lot of food service jobs. I worked food service jobs in Boone and I worked food service jobs in Charleston. And like you put it on thick for the tourists in Charleston, right? Like you very specific, they want to hear it. If they come in and you are behind the bar and you don't have a thick Southern accent in Charleston, they like, they, you know, immediately are suspicious and they don't want to give you money. So you have to lay it on really thick. And then I, you know, went from that space to an academic space in Charleston where actually lots of the people there weren't Southern. And so there wasn't quite as much accents, but then moving to Boston and you have to take on the like very particular academic tone that doesn't have, like, not only is it a weird way of talking, but it's also like, doesn't have the accent, right? And so it's like this back and forth of the ways you use, like I've used my, used or not used my accent over. And when I was like, you know, very rebellious punk teenager in Appalachia. I like tried not to have an accent because I just like, didn't want to be a heck or whatever, right? And so it was like all of these kind of things tied up in it. Uh, yeah, very much code, code switching. <laughs> and then it would only come out uh, if I was like mad or if someone asked, if someone called a, a cookout barbecue and I had to like lecture about what actual barbecue is. <laughs> And then like the accent would come out, right? So um, anyway, those are just my thoughts on y'all's comments, which I think are great. So uh, as far as my chapter, um, I, I think kind of similar to other folks, I did some some sort of identity sort of thinking in the, in the introduction to it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I definitely didn't grow up with, you know, language to talk about being non-binary. It was something that I came to as I was older. Um, I always knew that I was I mean, queer, like I definitely always knew that I was not a straight person, but you know, the different ways that that was either sexualized or downplayed or like sort of framed in different kinds of ways as I was growing up. Um, you know, it didn't feel like a real or valid thing until I was definitely like an older adult. Um, so sort of thinking through those things and, uh, you know, in, in a way this piece was also very reactionary to many things of, of a lot of what I was hearing in regards to the election of Trump, right? And so coming from all these people in Boston, which like Boston is a notoriously racist and very white city. And like this like idea that the source of racism in the United States was either the South, um, you know, which obviously erases the large proportions of black and brown people that live in the South or Appalachia specifically. And that it was like, backwards or trapped in a different time. And I'm like, we exist in the same time frame that you do. You can't like decide that people exist in a different time because they aren't operating in a way that you think is progressive, right? Or they are operating in a certain kind of way. And so we can't like relegate racism to this thing, you know, or white supremacy to this thing that exists within the past. It's a thing that exists wholly within the, sort of the modern and present moment. And so that was like, I guess the beginnings of thinking about it and then working in the archives. So the TVA archives are, are massive. They're um, in a National Archives and Record Administration uh, regional location, which is in Morrow, uh, Georgia, just south of Atlanta. So I spent a couple of summers down there doing research. They're absolutely huge. They're really hard to navigate. They have wonderful archivists there who have helped me navigate them. And so it was a lot of like archive attention issues of like I went to research like the stuff that I wanted to write about in Memphis but then I kept finding all these folders about Roanoke which was near where I grew up and um you know got really uh into these books which I knew from being a photography uh, undergrad the name Lewis Hine he was a sociologist and photographer from New York who had done a lot of photographs that I like studied in my history of photography class I had never heard that he came and did these projects in Appalachia hooked up to the TVA and so finding that archive and these really beautiful images. Um, the, so basically he came and he did a bunch of documentation of the very first town that the TVA flooded in 1933 of Lewiston, Tennessee. Um, you know, and if you go and pull up, there's lots of really great documentaries about the TVA and they are just like this really stereotypical Appalachian poverty porn of like little barefoot kids running around in these dry dusty fields and that, um, you know, there was some kind of modernity or betterment that was promised in the infrastructure of the TVA, you know, in the construction of these really huge dams, um, in the electrification of the rural South, uh, particularly Appalachia in certain kinds of ways. And to do that, they had to like paint once again, Appalachia is this place that was backward that kind of needed this technological salvation of this infrastructure project. Um, but when you look at these photographs, you don't see that. You don't see that unless you just automatically equate subsistence living, plant time living, you know, these kinds of things, um, 
you know, with poor or hard living. And it's not, you know, which is one of the things I say in the chapter is, you know, you know, poverty in Appalachia is very real to this day. It's very real. And it's very much, you know, what I grew up in and around in Appalachia. And so not trying to disregard that, but like this idea that there was something just inherently backwards and wrong about people that were living in Appalachia that had to like be saved by these little engineers and their white button ups and their ties, you know, in opposition to sort of farmers and overalls so was really compelling to me and seeing it in the images. And like I said, I had been working um, with a really wonderful uh, BB, the BBQ group at Harvard and sort of thinking through um, some of the ways that post-colonial indigenous scholars have written about um, time and, and sort of thinking about why, you know, in sort of, uh, you know, picturing certain kinds of places and certain kinds of people, we cast them as being in the past, even though obviously they kind of inhabit the same timeline as everyone else. And so that's what I was sort of thinking about. And um, I write about infrastructure, I study infrastructure, I'm absolutely fascinated by infrastructure. And that's an ongoing kind of theme in infrastructure studies is what's promised in infrastructure, which is a certain kind of modernity, which isn't like a, a point on timeline to be achieved, but something that is is sort of deeply tied to these kind of capitalist uh, nation state sort of patterns of development, right? Quote unquote development, um, which of course the United States likes to posture that we're we're at the forefront of. But you know, I mean, in Appalachia, we know that that's not true. We don't have broadband uh, on you know native reservations. We know that's not true. There's no running water on lots of them. And, you know, kind of these uh, you know down here in the deep south, we have issues with sewage, particularly in Alabama. And so, like this idea that the United States is this heavily developed nation that kind of grows out of these you know technological sublime projects of the TVA as I was thinking of and then um, at the end of it just thinking about I, I, I kind of related to this idea of plant time but you know I, the history of science lens that we love to talk about deep time right and sort of just thinking about this really long deep time history of Appalachia and how we're just going to reduce it to a little talking point of you know and how that's you know deeply white supremacist, it's deeply, deeply settler, and it's deeply, um, you know, erases sort of all of these other things. And so that was where the chapter kind of ended up going. Um, I also already like would write this totally different, <laughs> but that's, that's, I think what work that you're interested in does, right? Like I've written some other stuff that I'm like, yeah, but you know, whatever, like it's fine. But, you know, already I'm like sort of thinking through some of the things I was doing here in the ways you know, these kind of, yes, there is a dispossession of land in Appalachia, but I hit, you know, I talked about it a little bit. It is, you know, a lot of these are settler land claims and, you know, that there is this kind of settler move to innocence that happens when you position yourself as another kind of dispossessed group. But that doesn't mean that those people did have their land taken from them, right? Like often under these really um, uh, not quite forthwith circumstances and, and without understanding that like if you owned property you got some money but if you just you know had an agreement to like have a house on somebody's property you didn't get any money and so you know, it doesn't make that not an actual like real and valid experience of loss and so um, thinking about some of the, the ways that uh, you know we think we have private property and, and land ownership in this country but you know the bottom line is if the nation state and industry visa, industry visa, even the nation state wants your land, they're going to take it from you, um, is sort of something that I think about more broadly in my work. But that's a little preview of my chapter. I feel like there's so much I want to talk about. I feel like temporality keeps coming up. You know, I've been thinking a lot about tone and, and how advocacy and scholarship and art kind of are touching all those spaces. But I think the first question, which is, is someone brought in the, in the chat, that I think we just, you know, took 50 minutes into this to think through. But how do you understand Appalachia? You know, how do you understand queerness as a concept of queerness for yourself and queer Appalachia as this, this larger idea, right? And it's funny that it, it's something that is always there and we all use it in, in different ways. And it's, you know, and everyone's been using it in slightly different ways. I'm just super excited to hear from you all. Kendall. Man. Um, well, okay. I feel like that's a really hard question to answer. <laughs> um, just full stop. But I feel like both terms, like queerness and also Appalachian, is both ideas um, can be used to different political ends, maybe is what I want to say. Like, <laughs> they can mean a multitude of things so like you know Appalachia it's like it can be a region but even that the boundaries of that it's like whose boundaries like what time period like 
are we talking about land? Are we talking about people? I, I, is it Tuesday? I mean, do you know what I mean? It literally changes like that, depending on who's asking and what, what the intention is behind the ask, I think, or maybe the answer, what's behind the answer. Um, and as far, so I'll, I'll leave it like a toss up for me about what Appalachian-ness is. Do, let me articulate, let me be specific. appalachian is to me right now, right now at 7.49 p.m. this fine Thursday is like, it's a space, but not necessarily that is geographical or, or, or a place that I can go to, it can be. But to me, it feels more of like how I've learned to situate myself in the world or how I've learned to um, see the things around me, which is, is literally like, any kind of episteme, <laughs> like that, that, that's the literal definition. So, um, so it's like how, how I, how I live in the world. Um, so, so, so that, um, my queerness is the same. Um, and, and how I define queerness, the cool thing I think about queerness is that it's super queer. <laughs> like it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's in flux. It's, it's consistently moving, it's growing, it's it, it's sort of like this cool, I, I dance too much, like it's it's amoebic, it, it becomes and it and it retracts, but it also like it's all it's it it's it's inclusive, but it's inclusive in the way that like it has space for everyone. Um in my kind of queerness. And that's what I think true queerness is. It's like, it's not like, no, you're not like, there's space for all the different kinds of queers and the way that we all live um, in this crazy world. Like it, that, that's, that's what feels, that's what queerness feels like to me. Are we going in this order still? Okay. Um, I think I would make an idiot of myself if I tried to explain Appalachia. Um, Cause it's not, it is not, that is not my scholarship. The boundaries of what is Appalachia and what is not, I mean, <laughs> I mean, so to me, Appalachia is just a bunch of memories of like, I just woke up completely soaked um because of all the dew <laughs> um I you know like my first shot of moonshine like like literally some of it is super stereotypical um <laughs> but, but it's also like true um uh that was disgusting sorry that was kind of a visceral memory just now um Queerness, I've thought a lot more about uh, the like where boundaries are there largely because some of the same experience of being like, well, yeah, I'm queer, but like early on thinking like, oh, am I bisexual? Am I like, and th that was it. It was like, you could be gay, you could be straight, you could be bisexual. And those were the only options. And, um, but then like that was a whole can of worms that was, I don't know, hard to deal with and felt like a battle. And then there was another battle that came up for like, like thinking about it, my pansexual. And then there was another battle of coming out that felt like, oh, I'm uh, non-binary. And then there's another battle of like, oh, can I claim transness? It's an umbrella term, but like, but if I don't like have top surgery, can I, can I still like claim this? And I don't want to do that. And like, and then like reading a whole lot of like, um, see Riley snorting and just being like, like, I mean, if, if C. Riley snorting can not take hormones then I cannot take hormones, like fine. Like that's cool. Um, anyway, there's like, um, I think the thing that I love about queerness and why it felt like like a, a lot of those like identity boundary battles for me were in that took place in places like Instagram, 
not my life, not my people. Like those, those trying to put myself in a box never happened with a human being um, that was in front of me usually. Um, and happened more in my head and on the internet than anywhere else. And, um, and I think that like, that's one of the ways that I feel like I always carry the South with me into places because like I've, I've said this probably three times now, but, but that the community of, of queers that I developed in the South would never doubt for a second, no matter who I was dating, no matter what decisions I was making, they would be like, you're, you're queer, the end. And um, if you have, you know, a, like an ounce of queerness in you, then you get to you get to hang out with us because you're going to stand up, you're going to be with us, you're going to show up for us, you're going to, you know, mourn with us and grieve grieve with us and fight with us, <laughs> and um, I feel like. For me, the boundaries of queerness have always been about like, are you being a good ally to, are you being a good ally to yourself as a queer? <laughs> are you unpacking your internalized stuff? Are you helping your people unpack their internalized stuff? Are you fighting for each other? Are you using your privilege when you can? And those mean, those boundaries mean a lot more to me than, um, you know, somebody's like trans enough points or like whatever the stuff that I feel like I used to worry about and I'm just like I don't have time <laughs> there's so much else so much else to worry about than whether or not I qualify or whether or not somebody else qualifies and particularly people who are like just coming to like recognizing their queerness it's it just feels real important to hold them where they're at so in short I feel very inclusive about queerness and I have a lot of homework to do about the boundaries of Appalachia I literally googled it I was like what are the boundaries of Appalachia I have no idea anyway Hannah um yeah, I think both of these things are obviously hard to pin down for many reasons, right? Of like being Appalachian is not a monolith, being queer is not a monolith. And so like, it's an interesting and good question because everyone's thing is gonna be a little independent. I obviously have like a, a historical lens of sort of thinking about the land of Appalachia and, and sort of how it came to be and the particular um, reasons that, uh, you know, Native peoples were removed from it and the reasons that certain kinds of settlers moved into it, there was a real attraction to the Appalachian area um, versus you know, the kind of plantations of the deep south or the more sort of metropolitan areas of the coast. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts about Appalachia in the same way I have a lot of thoughts about other regional identities in the United States because they're really unique. And I think they kind of come from uh, um, one of the many kind of deep settler panics of so many people are here as other settlers or immigrants or you know members of diaspora who are deeply disconnected from other kinds of cultures and kinship that you would have had if you had not come here as a settler, right? And so we create these kind of regional identity. And I have a whole, I could go off on a whole spiel about you know how this plays into certain kinds of developments of white supremacist groups of like people just don't have other forms of kinship and so they they end up hitched up to stuff that's actually really, you know, sort of toxic in certain kinds of ways because it's not cultural right it's racially based and so um you know regional identities serve a certain kind of purpose in the United States because we are this you know quote unquote melting pot of particularly sort of settlers who have moved away from from their um uh traditional sort of cultures and and had to recreate new ones here and so anyway I could go on and on about that um but I think in general like many you know Appalachia has a, Appalachian life has a certain kind of rhythm and obviously a certain kind of culture and you know, I think different kinds of kinship and my, my, I grew up in Appalachia, but my parents did not. My parents are both from Florida, so still Southern, but, but not Appalachia. I know it's weird to hear of people growing up in Florida. It's a rarity, but they, they did it. That's what, they, that's where they were raised, um, which is itself a bundle of a whole different kettle of fish. Um, so, uh, you know, but there's just something about, you know, maybe it's, you know, kind of, we could connect across rural spaces, but um, 
I don't know, the mountains, the Blue Ridge, the Appalachian Mountains that the region sort of develops around just have their own kind of character. You know, they're not like the Rockies. They're not, uh, you know, like the Himalayas. It's 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 also sort of, for me, deeply tied to environment and deeply tied to, to land and, and sort of thinking about this as like the space that is home. Um, and I don't know, I mean, the, the like thing of like, are you Appalachian if you live in Appalachia for a little while? Are you still Appalachian if you leave? Which I think you are, or unless, you know, some people decide not to be. Um, and as far as being queer, it's it's interesting because actually I, none of my really close friends when I was growing up identified as queer, but we have basically all <laughs> come out since, right? And so it wasn't so like, it's it's like looking back on it and I'm like, oh, that was the thing that we all had in common. We used to joke about how we didn't have really have things in common. And you look back on it and you're like, oh man, we were all deep in the closet. That was it. That was the thing we all had in common. Um, So, you know, it wasn't necessarily that we put, words on it when we were, were you know, younger and, and kind of have kind of come to those things now. And a lot of my, I guess, queer community is, is both at home in Appalachia and uh, um, also a lot of folks in Boston and, and Charleston. So, but for me, um, queerness kind of put, thinking through my, and Zane, was it you who made the really funny meme that's like, once you figured out your sexuality, your gender identity, like, comes back. I was coming, I posted it, yeah, that was the same time. It's like, yeah, I'm bi, and then it's just, like, being trans, though. <laughs> yeah, uh, when Sarah was talking about that, I was like, oh, man, same. Like, and so, you know, you really, but, it, you know, queerness gave me language for a lot of things that I just kind of viewed as, as shortcomings, um, you know, not being feminine enough or not sort of, um, you know, playing into a, you know, I mean, we know that in Appalachia in the South, there is a very particular sort of brand of femininity and expectations of femininity and like never meeting those and just being like, oh, I'm just a tomboy or like, I don't fit into this. And, and it's such a different, you know, language to be like, oh, this isn't a shortcoming. It's, it's literally just another and different valid way of being and existing in the world. And, you know, the shortcomings of like, oh, do I like hanging out with my friends or do I want to sleep with my girlfriends? Like, you know, and so like that was just, you know, and yeah, am I not interested in boys enough? Uh, you know, and all these kinds of things that, that you think you just kind of have viewed for a really long time and, and not really wanting to get married or, and I'm not, you know, I've chosen to live my life childless and like all these kinds of things that, um, you know, are kind of outside of the traditions that are still pretty deeply, you know, seeped in in the South and in Appalachia and, and queerness has just given me certain kinds of language to not view that as as not being enough or not sort of like existing. And and we could talk about the like belonging in all different, I feel that in all different groups. Am I Appalachian enough? Am I queer enough? Um, am I native enough? I mean, like the, the one thing is being the privilege to be an enrolled native person is I have three different pieces of government identification that tell me that I'm native. <laughs> so, you know, one from my tribe and two from the BIA. And so like, that's like, oh, I got my paperwork, but no one gives you like the Appalachia paperwork or your queer card. So, you know, it's a little bit different and there's this kind of like I, I am kind of a bit done with this like is it enough it's like I don't I'm tired I don't care anymore <laughs> so, but it should be you know the, the dream is that it would be inclusive the dream is that it is something that um uh you know exists outside of uh exclusive kind of restrictive normative structures um obviously queerness does not always operate in that kind of a way but that would you know be the way that that you know if we could build new worlds that would be the way that it would go so when I found the community with Electric Dirt and Queer Appalachia, it was, I identified as non-binary for two years, but I didn't really identify as queer. I didn't identify as trans and I didn't really identify as Appalachian because I I didn't see myself in any of those those words. I didn't have the vocabulary for it, right? Like that we keep bringing up. And it was in my, when I started going through the zine, it was very cathartic for me because I was able to actually do, like I find magazines, I cut them up like old school and like draw breasts or X out breasts, right? And it was like my way of conceptualizing this trauma I had around my body that I hadn't understood was dysphoria for my whole life, right? And so when I was able to find this community, I'm like, well, there's something queer about Appalachia all the time. Right, that I didn't see till I was outside of the region. And like you're saying, a lot of your friends were queer, like the amount of queerness that was happening and just not named, right? And the way that then I left West Virginia and then that was seen or understood as queer was something that was very interesting for me. So I found a lot of freedom 
with being able to reorientate myself to these ideas of Appalachia as specifically a queer space. Um, and that was really freeing for me. But then I found that I started questioning right about what it means to, to queer a space that you're a settler on, which is what I've been working on some a few other collections trying to figure that out. And then, you know, this book is from 2018, 2020. And when I was, I was in this, I was talking in conversation with Tennessee Jones and I said, they asked, they were interviewing me um, for the work they'd been doing. And they were like, what does Appalachia mean to you? And I'm like, Appalachia is inherently queer, but I don't know if I believe that anymore. Um, and it's something that I believed in this book and really oriented this book around, or, you know, at least my perspective and frame for it. But when I'm thinking through this question about how I understand Appalachia and how I understand my own queerness now, I think it's a really interesting dichotomy between freedom and empowerment and then like shame, right? And that's like a political orientation too. Like I think the way I understand Appalachia and queerness is on the defensive, right? And I, I, this book is really about optimism and I was so adamant trying to say there's something wrong with Appalachia, right? Or there's something wrong with, with I, don't, I don't have pain or shame around queerness. Um, but two years later, like I've been really thinking through how even that trying to completely embrace a space that in a lot of ways does, you know, have problems like anywhere else and identities that do have actual political, you know, and cultural trauma attached to them. And so that's kind of what I've been working on now from a personal level is trying to create and understand myself as Appalachian, even though I'm not in Appalachia anymore. Can I even, you know, should I even be doing this collection? I've been lived in Appalachia now for four years of more than four years. Can I understand queerness? You know, and what if I come in and out of these identities? You know, I was on testosterone, wasn't on testosterone. And it's really about how people see me um, that I feel a lot of shame about or 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 questioning my own identities, right? And people don't know I'm Appalachian, if people don't don't understand me as a trans person, like what that means like for me. Um, so that's kind of where I am. It's, it's like, I feel like it's gotten messier since this collection's come out actually, or since I finished this collection, but it's still a growing space. But I really think that it also is about not having to translate myself. Like when I'm back in Morgantown, I don't have to translate queerness. I don't have to translate my identity. I don't have to translate the way I see the world. Uh, like when I'm outside of that, I have to continually try to translate my experiences and translate my identity and and speak a certain way right we're talking about accents like I say sorry after I, if I when I'm drunk and I, I and I sound redneck right and despite how much I might say that you know that I there's no shame around Appalachia there is uh, for me in, in my experience and so that's kind of where I am now uh, I just want to tell the audience that, you know, please do the Q&A if you have questions. We would love to, to chat with you and, and, and in conversation with you. I, I want to ask the speakers right now about tone because, you know, we're such an, like, out of all the contributors are so interesting. I think it really shows what queer Appalachian is, can be understood as, right, because we, I feel like we never had um, the freedom to not be politicized or not have our identities politicized. And I feel like that really shapes the way we understand the world. And I think that for those of us who do scholarship, you know, how that can impact the work that we do and why we do it, you know, trying one of the things in this collection was to make it as accessible as possible and really comes from a, an understanding of, of personal identity and, and healing and community and, and also art and world building so I, I'd love to hear a little bit about how the the tone and the audience and your own work and your own experiences kind of created the way you wrote your chapters and what it looked like to be in conversation with others. Kendall, you don't have to go first. We're going to start with Hannah this time so you can relax. And switch it up. We're going to reverse it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I... And it, it sounds like we definitely all kind of operate in, in academic or para-academic spaces, but, you know, there's just, particularly in, okay, so first of all, lots of history writing is just really effing boring, and I'm not trying to, like, say that to be offensive to history, but lots of academic, lots of history writing is just really dry, and so first of all, like, narrative and telling a good story and like having that um 
uh, Bill Cronin has a really excellent, like, in defensive narrative essay that I turn to a lot of, um, you know, I feel like sometimes academic writing can get so bogged down in like making an argument or, or contributing to theory or sort of doing these, you know, which is like what academic does I mean it is the source of knowledge production, quote unquote, but like, man, that stuff gets really dry. And so I always try to center story. And even like in my really academic writing, I try to be like, okay, what is the heart of the story that I'm telling? But it was really nice. And well, first of all, I was, I like wrote personally about myself, which I was like, this is deeply uncomfortable. You know, I'm, I'm used to being the like view from nowhere objective. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of my work does draw on, um, you know, positionality, sort of canonically Patricia Hill Collins, like thinking about, you know, you know, yourself as a person positioned within your work, and there's also this stream of thinking within STS, Donna Haraway and Sandra Harding of like strong objectivity and that actually like we tell better stories when we talk about the people that we are. And we tell better stories when we talk about the places that we're from or that we're connected to. And so much of academia is extractive, right? Like it's about taking your couple of months and parachuting into a place and doing your archival research or your ethnographic research and you're going to start on anthropology and like, or even like the sciences doing your, you know, field work or your community-based research. And then you like go back to where you do your writing and you do your work there. And that's like not, you know, it's not really about being deeply tied to a place, but when you read something by someone who positions themselves kind of within, you know, the, the parameters of their work and writes about something that they're really passionate about, I feel like that's a different story. And so it was both about myself and sort of positioning myself within this world. And it was really kind of nice to, just write about home, right? And like write about some things that I think about about home, um, grapple with some stuff about home, which is a really complicated place, but also just like try to tell a really interesting story about these people that were were there in the archive and, you know, I think would have never, you know, named themselves as queer Appalachians, but, you know, thinking about the ways that, you know, people queered them and thinking about where they were in, in time and space, even though they were operating the same, uh, timeline and and being able to just kind of like luxuriate in some stuff that you don't really get to do in as much academic writing um so that was I think something that I found really kind of fun about the tone of the piece and and thinking through it and I know my earlier drafts were probably very academic and overachieving and then I just kind of sat down and spent a you know a hard weekend revising is all of the writing right revising and totally switching the thing around and and taking you know the argument from the beginning of it and putting it at the end and I know that seems kind of silly but there's this formula to academic writing that um it was really nice to be able to to think about it and, and play with in this piece and I also got to do a lot of my rewriting after I'd already read everyone else's really excellent pieces and so I was like oh man I gotta step it up <laughs> Yeah, you're still in the middle, sorry. It's okay. I, I'll be like the cream in the center of the donut or eclair or whatever. Um, I'm happy for it. Um, tone, yeah. So, I mean, I've already talked about the tone of this a little bit in that um, it was entirely verbal. Um, this was a transcript of, of something that I was, a talk that I was giving in spaces. And I, I got to, play with it a little bit because I mean Zane at one point was like um uh, well I think I had expressed some like uh discomfort with like I had just sort of tried to write out what it might sound like um to say some of these words but I, I feel like it never really works and then I, I ended up going into this like deep well like two years after Zane first suggested I do it of trying to like um uh, write it out in um, IPA, the, the was International Pronunciation Alphabet. Um, and that was a whole adventure because the a lot of the, the, the bots on the internet that'll repeat IPA back to you, you have to pick what accent they're using. Um, so who knows if what I actually ended up writing was something that can be legible to like a Southern per person who can read IPA. I don't even know, but all of it's fiction anyway. And that like, I'm just guessing you would say like the, what I actually wrote was that it would be non with like a long A, non, ba, ne, re. And like, that's a really, like, it feels weird in my mouth. It doesn't feel quite right, but like, 
also accents are developed so much through um, groups of people saying things um, that for one human to sit here and say like, is that how non-binary would sound? Um, sort of like mashing together a bunch of words that like, I know that's how my mom would say non, or that's how I would say non, or like, but like really not sure how to end that word. But anyway, like all of the, the tone for me was very much like, um, one directed at clear, clear and concise communication. When I am given the privilege to write for 10 pages, I often do, and that doesn't usually help. So trying to keep it really pared down felt really important to me, partly because it came from a, a, a speaking a lot of speaking engagements that are, were 20 minutes long, partly because I love to talk. So like giving myself a script um, felt really important. Um, but also the tone really felt like, I felt so strange uh, to think about it because I always think of my stuff as, as para-academic. Like I, I, I work for a library, that's my day job. But I have I've made some walls that I may need to break down, but I've made some walls between me and academia um, for a bit for sanity and safety and growth. And like I said, may need to break those back down. But um, especially as I was writing this, I, I wanted to, I didn't want to touch academic writing with a 10 foot pole, but I also, did like um, that I knew that that this work would be couched in amongst a lot of really interesting, thoughtful people because that the approach of academia to like, uh, you know, deep thought on something that might look small, um, like that deep exam, like the inch wide mile deep felt really good. Um, for this work to be around. Let me think if there's anything else that I want to say about tone. Oh yeah, usually like uh, when I give this, like I actually wrote, I left in this piece, the very end of it, um, a thank you to the audience that I always did when I said it out loud, because I, I usually get this big group of people who don't have Southern accents trying to do one back at me, which usually wouldn't feel good, but does in this case. And, um, <laughs> uh, and at the end of it, I always say, um, y'all have no idea how heartwarming that was. And, and leaving that in the writing, in writing felt so strange, but also so important because it, like that's sort of how I feel toward the whole group of people who submitted to this. Is this like, y'all don't know how heartwarming this is. Love that. <laughs> um, I, it was funny because uh, preparing for this, I, I looked over y'all's work just to know like what you're, what you're doing and, and, and what you were writing about. And I actually read that and was like, <sighs> <laughs> so I'm so glad that you left that in. <laughs> um, so about tone. Um, okay. So first, um, I it, it relates, but I want to go back to something Zane said. Um, I don't remember exactly. It was something about like the the not I, I get maybe Hannah said it too um about not not being the like appropriate version of what you know where you're from deems you like feminine enough or or uh, where you were being queer enough or trans enough I guess we've all talked about it um enough of of what you were claiming you were or what you were stating as, as who you are um I was in a a, a writing class of sorts. And um, I've been working really diligently on, on my queer theory and how it sounded. And I was just being very diligent about it. And um, so I'm reading it aloud in class. And um, 
one of my friends and mentors, Guatemoc, reached over and they were like, baby, you don't have to do that here. Your per you don't have to prove your queerness here anymore. You don't have to. You're queer enough. You're, you're beautiful and perfect. You're, you're, you don't have to do, you don't have to prove it. And I just remember being like blown away by that. And then also how that, the tone of my writing was like trying to prove like I was. And I was like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, I, I didn't mean to do that, but like I, I was subconsciously because I felt guilty or I felt shameful of not being able to utilize it correctly. But also that comes from like feeling like I wasn't smart enough to be in grad school. Like I shouldn't be there for some reason. So trying to like out queer theory, the other queers anyway. Um, but, but, the, but co that coming across in tone versus just being like, I'm here, this is what you got. Right. Um, so I, I think that also reflects in the way that I, I, I try to write like one of my, another, one of my mentors, Priya Srinivasan said to me once, like, I wanted my mom to be able to read my book. And I was like, I was blown away by that. And I was like, yeah, and there's no reason that, that she shouldn't be able to, or, you know, any, like it should be accessible. That's the thing about theory, that it doesn't mean shit if it's not accessible to people. So for me, it, it really is about like praxis, like how the things that I know, how the things that I do, what they have to offer theory and what that conversation can be. And if I'm using theory that I don't fully understand, which is a lot of things, but I work, I, I try to figure it out so that I can explain it to like my brother <laughs> or do you know what I mean? Like anybody. And it's like, you know, sometimes I feel like we, in particular, I am in an academic space. I have to write academically sometimes, but if I can't explain what I'm saying, I'm just like dropping in these words. It's like, what are you doing? So um, I, <laughs> my dissertation chair laughs at me. She's like, wow, you've really taken the hard road, but, um, let's do this. Um, so, so she's very supportive, but it's really important to me that if I am going to use these things, I am going to articulate these theories and, and, and say these like things that make me, you know, acceptable and like fancy in the academic world. I, I better know what the hell I'm talking about. So, um, yeah, relatable. I, I want people to read it and understand what I'm trying to say. So, so I think we only have uh, about nine minutes left. So I'm, I'm gonna do one quick and, and short question. Um, I'm trying to tie everything together, but it would just be, I'm just wondering what you all have found most fulfilling. Like what are your, what your favorite chapter in the book was, or what do you, what do you want the audience to, of the, the readers to, feel impacted by this? What message do you want them to get? Or what has been most fulfilling or what has grown out of this community we created together? So just like a heartwarming few minutes there. Hannah. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I've liked meeting y'all. Um, I have a little a little warm and fuzzy story and then I have some thoughts related to this and connecting it to the other question that's in the chat um I think one of my favorite parts is when I was copy editing reading Julie Ray's piece but not like seeing their name first and being like yeah this really sounds like Franklin County and then I went back and looked at the name and I was like oh damn I know them <laughs> and like <laughs> Um, we didn't know each other super well in high school. They were one or two years below me. And I like realized looking back on it that I've just like only hung out with my friends and <laughs> didn't go to other people. I don't know. Like I was very self-centered, aren't all like teenagers. But um I it was really like awesome to email them and be like, this is incredible. I had no idea, like they're also a photographer. I was like, I had no idea you were a photographer, like. Uh, your work is incredible. This is so dope to read. It's really nice to reconnect with you. And so that was just like 
I like all the chapters, but I, I am a little partial to Julie Ray just because I think it's great. And I, I think that their photography is incredible. And it was really nice to like have this reconnection with a person that like, like we weren't even friends like on any kind of social media. Like I don't, like I wouldn't have really like, I think reconnected with them in any kind of way. And so that was sort of a warm and fuzzy. Um, but one of the things that I hope like kind of comes out of this and other projects and sort of all of this kind of movement of, you know, whatever you want to call academic scholarship or uh, Appalachian scholarship, and I'll wrap up because I've only got a few minutes is this, question and chat about sort of like approaching stereotypes. And I think it's really important to write about stuff that's true and point out that some of these things aren't stereotypes, but they're systemic issues, right? And so how do we take a stereotype of poverty or of backwardness or of, you know, redneck and re-ascribe history to it and re-ascribe like, you know, I never grew up knowing, you know, that redneck came from the mine wars. Like I, I, I've only ever heard it as a derogatory term. And so when we write about things truthfully, the good and the bad, we're able to kind of identify, okay, like poverty is a systemic problem. You know, white supremacy is a systemic problem. Like these aren't just sort of like stereotypes that are throw away and everyone that from there is like that, but we can speak, you know, truth to power in certain kinds of ways. And if someone reads that and they, it just reinforces a stereotype for them, that's fine. That's not your audience. <laughs> like You're not going to win every battle. So, um, and I hope that that's like what comes out of this kind of work and, and sort of the other work that Dane and all of, you know, the, the scholars that are scholars and activists and artists that are involved in this project are, you know, doing in certain kinds of ways. So. I'm going to hop on just to say like, yes, 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 yes. About like, that's not, not the audience. Also, yes, 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 Julie Ray. Um, because, yeah, so funny. Like, I'm, I already mentioned that we went to grad school together and Julie Ray was a couple of years ahead of me and was such a force for me. Um, I, don't, I don't think they even know, but um, someday I'll tell them. Um, Anyway, yeah, I would like to get back to this question about the perpetuating negative stereotypes. I um I have met a couple of people, queer folks in California, who had not had lived experience in the South, but they had uh, quite a few people of like African diaspora descent. Um, well, of of Af African diaspora. Whose folks were from the South and moved um, during the Great Migration over um, to California, and listening to their experiences, like going back to the South and trying to trying to connect to their families' roots, and and having just a really weird time with it all. And um, there is one person who is working in California named Indira Allegra, um, and we were baristas together at a cafe <laughs> and you know as you do with like just rubbing elbows with geniuses right um as a barista um and she they uh had this one moment where we were talking about you know literally at 7 a.m making espressos and talking about um generational trauma and whose work, like who you're making work for. And they said this thing to me about like, what if, what if uh, you never ever had to explain yourself? And I still, like, I think about this, it's been like three years since they said that to me. And I, um, I still think about it, but I also, I used to think maybe it would be better if I just didn't think about the audience at all. Like if I wrote into the void or wrote back to myself or something. And I didn't like that either um, because it sort of felt pointless. <laughs> I was like, I could, I talk to myself all the time. I don't really need to do it on paper. And that's a lie. I do need to do it on paper. It's different. But um, but the the sort of place that I've come to with the, when talking about, home when talking about anything that's hard um, is having a very clear and like beautiful um, mental picture of of who I really want in that room 
And if I, if it starts to feel like nobody, then I start to write down names. And as I write down a name, I write down another name and another name and another name. And, um, uh, and think of it like, if I'm, if I'm building like the best birthday party on earth <laughs> and, and these are the people that I want to be having these conversations with slash also like prayer group or like a coven or something like if I'm, if I'm building the room that I want to talk to, I know that when I speak the truth, it will never come out like a stereotype to them. And yeah, sometimes that's a really very specific visualization and it sort of functions a lot like a loving kindness meditation where you are, you have to very clearly picture everything that you know about that person um, and do that over and over again with this group. Um, and then, I don't know, I think like when, when I do that exercise, uh, telling the truth does itself, it's easy. I'll, I'll jump in and wrap up quick, but just to bring everyone's attention to the chat where you can peep Julie Ray's uh, GoFundMe. Uh, so check it out over there. Um, <laughs> but uh, just to uh, quickly address the, the question in the chat or not the chat, but in the Q&A. Um, yeah, stereotypes. I, I mean, it's it's a mess, right? And, and the, with all the stereotypes, there's also like the things that are actively working against those stereotypes. So uh, there are multitudes, we all exist in multitudes, that, that's, that's how it works. And it's like nothing ties up in a pretty little bow with a, you know, a little package with a bow. So it's like, you're, you know, it, it just is what it is. So perpetuating or not, it, you know, it's part of the discussion. So just participate in the discussion, right? Um, and then a uh, uh, happy, lovey, fuzzy moment. Um, so I got to meet um, Zane in person. Um, I got to meet Maxwell, Julie Ray, and Rebecca Eli. Uh, and we had a lovely time um, signing um, our, our copies of the books at the Appalachian Studies Association Conference. And um, it, it like, the thing that I feel like gets left out, like, <laughs> there it is, there it is. The thing that I feel like gets left out a lot of this conversation is like love, you know, and, and like this community, like this community. And, and, and it's like, I, I felt it so much. Like, just, I, like, I didn't even know y'all. Like we just met for the first time, but because we'd been working together, it felt so good. Like when I hugged you guys, it felt, it felt so real. Like I hadn't seen you in so long and it just felt like, like, this is so cheesy, but it felt like coming home in a lot of ways. It was just like, like when you finally get somewhere and you're just like, ah, oh, here it is. And like, that 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 felt really really magical this project has 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 made um me kind of feel that in a way that uh you know in grad school is it, missing a lot um it, it's really uh like pushes you aside and you get to hide in your little study cove like a little monster and it like felt so cool to like be in a space with people and um like talk about like love and community yeah, and I'll just end saying that we had this event that was going to be taking place because ASA happened in my hometown. I'm working out with Eugenia, it just happened. So it was a very funny experience for me because this book came out about queerness in Appalachia happening in Morgantown. I got to meet all these people. And then we had a book release kind of celebration party at this bar that my mom had gone to when she was in high school, you know, doing straight edge days. There's stuff tons of bands and they all canceled for separate reasons, but almost was better because there was like a good 30, 40 of us in this space that meant so much to me for so much of my life. And we were able to just do like a book reading and talk and hold a community and hold space. And I was thinking after that, because I have so much fear about public speaking and I really don't like being in front of people. And I didn't have any of those issues because I realized I'd never been in a space that 
people that was for me, right? That I didn't have to perform for other people or that I didn't have to worry about their reactions or, or code switch or tone down who I was or what I was saying. And that was probably the most free and, and safe I've ever felt in my life. And I really think that's what this collection is about, is about speaking truth and healing and, and creating space and opening up these conversations for just more of this. So thank you all. Hey y'all, I don't know if I can say it any better than that, Zane. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all again. Uh, this has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. And um, for folks who are still here, um, I dropped a link in the chat to both the GoFundMe that was mentioned, as well as uh, a link to the book if you haven't picked up a copy yet, uh, which is a great way to support these writers as well as others uh, who involved in the collection. Um, if you registered for this event, you'll get a follow-up email with a link to a recording of the event. Um, so I think that this, this discussion will not only serve those here tonight who were able to witness it, but also viewers in the future. Um, and yeah, feeling really appreciative for that, uh, being a queer bookstore in Appalachia. It feels very fitting that we're able to host this conversation and share these thoughts and, and reflections with viewers and listeners in the future as well. So thanks again so much for taking the time to be here tonight. Thank you so much, Ash. Thank you all, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye now. Have a good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank y'all.